Okay, the recording has started. Okay, so we are continuing on this truth of identification, which Paul introduced for us in Romans chapter 5. And he's saying that now in Romans chapter 6, he's getting a little more deeper into this truth of identification. Now, this truth is so important. It is what enables us to live victorious over sin. This truth, <clears throat> this truth of identification, and Paul will mention that a little, <clears throat> a little later. We will see. But now, he says, you know, we saw in verse 2, Romans 6 verse 2, he says, but you died to sin. So we use this picture of an alcoholic who's dead. And when he's dead, he doesn't have any more inclination, desire to sin. You know, we're just using it in an analogy. Don't, ex don't take that picture or extrapolate that picture too much. Just, just a picture in your mind. So when did you and I die to sin? Paul begins to explain for us. Okay. So. Let's read now verses 3 to 5. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 5. Could somebody read that for us, please? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Mm. Knowing this, was okay, it yeah, about thank it? you. Verse 5 is good. Yeah, verse 5 is good. So in these three verses, verse 3, 4, and 5, Suddenly, Paul is telling us something new. And he's saying, hey, I want us to know that we have been baptized. He uses the word, verse 3, he uses the word baptized. The word baptize, uh, you know, nowadays when we use the word baptize, immediately we all think about what water baptism. It is fine, it is correct. But the word baptize simply means to immerse, to submerge, to put something small into something much bigger, baptize. So he's saying we have been baptized into Christ. So the water baptism is symbolic. So when a person is submerged in a pool of water, what has happened? Uh, the water overwhelms the person. So that person is lost, is submerged. And of course it is a symbolic, it's a physical expression of the spiritual reality. But here he's talking about spiritual reality. He says, look, the, verse three, do it not know as many of us were baptized into Christ. So we have been immersed into Christ. He's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about being baptized into Christ, not being baptized in water. Right? But baptized in, being baptized in water is an expression of this reality. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm trying to say is, in verse 3, saying, we have been baptized into Christ. We've been immersed into Christ. We are identified into Christ. So he uses two phrases which I want which might help us understand identification. In verse three, he says, we are baptized into Christ, or in uh, verse five, he says, we are united together, united together. So identification means I'm immersed into Christ. I'm united together with him. So that what happens to him happens to me. okay? So he says, don't you know, in verses 3, 4, and 5, he says, hey, we've been baptized into Christ, therefore, when he died, we died. 
we are baptized into his death. Verse 3. Verse 4. We were buried with him. When he was buried, we were buried. We were buried with him. And then, uh, just as he was raised from the dead, just as he was raised from the dead, that means when he raised from the dead, we also were raised from the dead. We were resurrected with him. So in verse 3, 4, and 5, he's saying, hey, identification. We died with him. That means we were crucified with him. We were buried with him. And we were raised with him. Because we are identified. We have been baptized. So we are united with Christ. So what happened to him happens to us. So now remember, this is an extension of what he has already shared in Romans 5. You know, just as we were identified with Adam, whatever happened to Adam happened to the whole human race. We we're also identified with the last Adam, the second man. But he's going into detail. Now he's saying we are identified with his death, with his burial, with his resurrection. And uh, we will see in other places in scripture, he talks about being identified with his ascension and also being identified with his exaltation, the seating at the right hand of the Father. So when Christ ascended, we ascended, and he was raised up, we were raised up. And when he was seated at the right hand of the Father, Ephesians 2 says, we were seated with him in heavenly places. So identification means we're united together with Christ, so united with him that what happened to him applies to us. And each stage means something real for us today. And we're going to look at it. So let me repeat. When Christ died, you and I died. When Christ was buried, you and I were buried. When Christ was raised, you and I were resurrected, you and I were resurrected. When Christ ascended, you and I ascended. When Christ was seated, you and I were seated with him. What does this mean to us in, every, in, in daily life? And you know, what, how does the truth of identification affect our lives? So in verse six, Let's read verses 6 to 8, please. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, please. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Okay. So let's look at verse 6 carefully. It says, knowing this. Knowing this. So it is something believers should know. Something you and I should know. What does Paul want us to know? It says, knowing this that our old man was crucified with him. So now he's talking about dying with him, being crucified with him. So when Christ died, you and I died. When Christ was crucified, you and I were crucified. But what part of us was crucified? He says, know this, I want you to know, that our old man was crucified with Christ. What is the old man? It's, the, it's talking about the life, the nature of sin that we received from the first man, Adam. So from Adam, we received the sin nature, the, the predisposition to sin, the sinful nature. So this, or some people call it the Adamic nature. So this nature, this old man, this Adamic nature, this nature that made us sinners, made us, 
predisposed to the sin and wanting to do evil. The old man was crucified with Christ. That means the old Adamic sinful nature, the old man, the nature that came from Adam, was nailed to the cross, put to death. Crucified means put to death. Dead. So you don't have an old man anymore. Because the old man was crucified, put to death, dead, killed, put an end to, and Christ died. So what you and I have now is what the Bible refers to as the new man. It's the life and the nature of the last Adam, the second man, Jesus Christ. We don't have what came to us from the first Adam, which is the old man. We have what God has given to us from the second man, then which the Bible calls as the new man, the life and the nature of God. So it says the old man, going back to verse 6, the old man was crucified with him. And what's the outcome of that? It says that the body of sin might be done away with or destroyed or disposed of. The word body of sin, what is that? The word body is used in the New Testament in many different ways. You know, we talk about the body of Christ, we talk about the human body. But here the body means the sum totality of sin, the full measure, the body, the sum totality of sin. The body of sin, the power of sin was done away with, destroyed, gotten rid of. And therefore, the result is that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Amen. So, to, be die, to die with Christ means it's the end of the old man, it's a destroying of the power of sin, and it's setting us free from the dominion of sin. We are no longer slaves of sin. That means there is no sin that can control you and me. And Paul will repeat that many times. There is no sin that can control you and me. Because the old man is crucified, the power of sin has been broken, and we are no longer slaves of sin. We are dead. That's why he said, we are dead. The old man is dead. The body of sin is done away with, the power of sin is done away with, so we don't have to be slaves of sin. And he repeats in verse 7, he who has died has been freed from sin. So you and I are free from sin. Freed from sin. He who is dead is freed from sin. Is that clear? Is verse 6 and 7 clear? What part of us died? When Christ died, we died with him. And therefore, we are free from sin. And so he says, verse 8, uh, eight, eight and 9, he goes on. You know, when Christ died, if, he, if we die with Christ, we will also live with him. So uh, it's not the end of everything. Uh, we died, but we're also going to be raised up. He's going to take us through. <laughs> we also raised up with Christ. And uh, verse 9, so when Christ died, when the Christ, when he's raised from the dead, 
death has no more dominion over him, right? So when he's raised up from the dead, everything of the past uh, has no more dominion over him, okay? Now, let's look at the rest of the sequence. So we were crucified with Christ, but we were also buried with Christ. We, he mentioned that for us here in verse 4. We were buried with him. So what does it mean to be buried with him? I mean, what does it mean? Now, you just imagine if a man who was living on the earth, let's say he got himself into a lot of debt. He had huge debt. Let's say he had um, a lot of... Uh, charges against him, maybe committed a lot of crimes, a lot of charges against him. Uh, let's say, you know, all these things are held against him. Now, this imagine this man dies and he's put into the grave. He's buried. He's dead and buried. What does that mean? It means nothing of earth life has any more claim on him. Nothing. This man's buried. Nothing of the earth life has any claim on him. He's not going to wake up on the other side and say, hello, you owe us so much money. <laughs> or, hey, you have all these charges against you. No, the old is gone. So being buried with Christ symbolizes the end of the old life, the, the end of the claim of the old life on us. The old has gone, gone. No more claim over you and me because we've abutted with Jesus. When Jesus was, was buried, you and I were buried with him. So in the spiritual, spiritually, right, uh, we are saying nothing of the old, which is darkness, nothing of the past life has any claim on you because you are a new creation, because you are in Christ. You've moved from Adam to Christ. And when you're in Christ, you're buried with him, the old life is ended, finished. No more claim on you, spiritually. And then he also says, we are, we were raised with him. We were raised with him. So we also will be living with him, we are raised with him. So resurrection, we are raised with him. Resurrected with Christ. So resurrection means, it says there, in end of verse 4, we walk in newness of life. So resurrection means you're coming up alive. But you're coming up alive in a different realm, in, in a new life. We are resurrected. We are resurrected not into the old, we are resurrected into the new. So we are resurrected with Christ, telling us that we have stepped into the new. Crucified, the power of sin is broken. Buried, the power of the old life ends. Resurrection, a new life begins. And it's very interesting here, in the newness of life, verse 4, the, the, the word life is zoe. Zoe means the life of God. You're walking in the newness of Zoe. What is this new life about? It's the God life. It's a God kind of life. It's the Zoe life. So we are crucified. We are buried. We are resurrected. Each has significance for us. I'm repeating, crucified, the power of sin is broken. Buried, the power of the old ends. Resurrection, we step into a new life. We are living 
in the Zoe life of God, the God kind of life. And the scriptures also tell us, you know, and 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 and, and you can look at it. It's in in your notes, in Colossians chapter three, verse one, and also yeah, Colossians three verse one. It says, "If you then were raised with Christ." Colossians chapter three verse one. If you were raised with Christ, so it's talking about us being lifted up, or when Christ ascended, we ascended, right? And and then the same thing is repeated for in Ephesians two. Ephesians two six, right? It says here, He raised us up together. Ephesians two verse six. He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. So when Christ ascended, you and I ascended. When Christ was seated, you and I were seated. So what does that mean? Ascend, we were taken out of this present evil age. That means this evil age can no longer dominate you. The influences of this evil age can no longer control you. Why? Because you ascended with Christ. You were taken out. So physically you and I are here, but spiritually we're taken out. We ascended with Christ. So this evil age, the influences of this evil age, the, the sin and the degradation, the corruption of this evil age cannot dominate us. This evil age, this world around us is driven by the spirit of disobedience. And that cannot control you and me. Why? Because we have been taken out. We have ascended. And then it also says we have been made to sit together. That means we're in a place of authority and dominion. God could not have could not have put us in a higher place. He said, sit with me. So you and I are in a place of great authority and dominion in the spiritual realm because we're seated together with Christ. So to be crucified means the power of sin is broken. To be buried means the power of the old ends. To be resurrected means we have stepped into a new life, a new way of life, which is the God kind of life. To be ascended means this system of evil has no more influence or domination on you because you and I have been taken out. To be seated together means we are in a place of great spiritual authority from which we live. Now this is spiritual reality, the spiritual truth. Just as what happened to Adam affected the whole human race, in Christ, all of this is true for you and me as believers. Are you, have you followed me till now? Is everyone together with me on this so far? Okay. All good? Collins? Okay. All right. Elisha, you with me? Okay. Okay. All right. I, I trust all of you are uh, following with me. Okay. I see your comments. Okay. Good. All right. So, okay. Brother Isaac, belated happy birthday. I think yesterday was your birthday. Was it? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> God bless thank you. you. You're welcome. All right. So, uh, So this truth of identification is real. Now, how do we live out of this? Now, what do we do with this truth? How do we apply this truth in our lives? Okay, so Paul is gonna uh, help us understand that, right? So, uh, let's read um, verse 
10 to the yeah let's read uh, I'm trying to break it down to smaller pieces um, 10 and 11 let's read verses 10 and 11 Romans 6 10 and 11 somebody could read that please Romans chapter 6 verses 10 and 11 the death he died he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to God in the same way count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus Thank you. So, so he says, today, Christ, you know, Christ has died, he's finished the work, and he's alive to God. So, verse 11, likewise. In other words, just as Christ is alive, he lives. I mean, it's a reality, it's truth. In the same way, likewise, just as we acknowledge the resurrection of Christ, he's alive. Likewise, you also, verse 11, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he says, I want you to, I want you to reckon. The word reckon means to count as a fact. So just as we reckon Christ indeed to be alive, there is no ambiguity, there is no doubt. Just as he is alive. Likewise, you reckon yourself to be dead, to sin. So count it like a fact, I am dead to sin. So the first step is to reckon, or you know, some modern versions will say consider, consider. Think about it as a fact. In the Greek, that word reckon is actually an accounting word. To reckon is an accounting word, uh, which is, you know, you can imagine if a man or somebody was counting money, right? They count all the notes and they say, okay, you know, 10 times 10 equals 100. He's reckoned it. There were 10, you know, whatever, 10 notes of uh, each value was 10. And so 10 times 10, 100. Now you can count it from top to bottom. You can count it from bottom to top. It's going to be 100. It's not going to change. You've got 10 notes. Each note value is 10. So it's going to be 100. In other words, you don't doubt it. It's reckoned to be so. It's counted. It's established. It's settled. And Paul says, likewise, you consider, now consider means not just, you know, casually think about it. It means you, you take this as a fact. Just like how an accountant, when he has reckoned the amount, nobody questions it. Why? He's reckoned it. He's counted it once or twice, thrice, whatever. But he said it's 100, it's 100, it's 100. There is no dispute, no question. So he says, likewise, reckon. No doubt, no question. No argument, you reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. So first step, what must I do with this truth? Reckon it. Accept it as fact. This is fact. I've counted it as a fact. I count it as a fact in my life. I am identified with Christ. I am crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended, seated with him. I reckon it as a fact. No doubts, no questions. I accept it. It's true. I'm dead to sin. I'm, the, I'm separate from the old. I'm walking in the new life. I'm separate from the ways of this world. I'm seated in a place of authority. I reckon it. 
then, because I have written it, verse 11, I will do something. Verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13. Somebody could read that, please. Romans 6, 12 and 13. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Mm. So 12, notice what he says. Because you reckon it, because you count it as fact and say, this is truth. I mean, there's no question about this. I accept this as truth. I am identified with Christ and I reckon it to be so. What will I do? He says, therefore, that means because you have reckoned it, therefore, what? Bring your whole body, your whole being, aligned to this truth. It says, do not let sin reign in your body. Because this is the truth. The truth says, sin's been broken. Sin's, the power of sin's been broken. Therefore, because this is true, give sin no place. Now, sin is all around us, right? There are people around us who are still having the old man, who are still yielding to the old man. There is still, there is still temptations around us and all of that. So sin is still around us. But you as a person, something's happened to you. You're identified with Christ. And you recognize that you were crucified, you were buried, you were resurrected, you were ascended, and you're seated with Christ. You rec reckon the truth, I accept it. Therefore, the sin that's around me, I'm giving you no place in me. So that's the next step. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your body. Don't let sin come in and take over. Because you know the truth. And you reckon it to be so. You accept it. That this is truth. So don't let sin come in and reign. Will sin try to? Of course it will try to. There's temptations all around. We're living in this, physically, we're living in this world. And sin's all around us. But do not let sin come in and take control. And thirdly, he says, verse 13, but instead, present your members, that means your body, your life on this earth. Present your members as instruments and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God. Present yourselves to God. That means your whole being is presented to God. So, reckon this truth, count it as true. Do not let sin come in. Do not let any of these things that you, you and I have been separated from come in and establish itself. Or reign in our body. Or And third, I will not submit myself to the old, what I have been separated from, but present yourself to God. So God, all of me is now yours. Because I know you already separated me from all of this. So present yourselves to God. And he says here, verse 13, as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That word instrument literally means a weapon, weapons. So now my being on earth 
becomes a means, a weapon of righteousness. That means through me, God, God's influence is going to be extended. I'm a weapon of righteousness. I'm a weapon against those very things that once controlled. You're a weapon of righteousness. Prison of God, I'm here for you. You've done this for me. I count it as a truth. I'm not going to let any of this sin, the past life, have any control of me. But Lord, I am yours, and now I'm your weapon on this earth. I'm here to carry out your purposes. I'm here to extend your influence on this earth. That's how we live. Because he goes on, verse 14, he says, because sin will not have dominion over you. Because you're not under law, but you're under grace. What does that mean? Because under law, the law told you what to do, what not to do, but didn't give you any strength. But under grace, which we have received through the last Adam, the second man, under grace, not only do we know what's right and wrong, but we are empowered to do it, to live in it. The law did not give us any strength to live in it. Grace gives us the strength, everything we need to live in it. So he says, you're under grace, and under grace, you've got everything you need, so sin will not have dominion over you. So, you know, and I, I just want to point out one more verse, uh, which is verse 17. Verse 17. We'll just read verse 17. Verse, somebody could read verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you entrusted. And verse 18 too, please. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Hmm. Now look at verses 17 and 18, which we just read. He says, you were slaves of sin. Verse 17. Verse 18. You have been set free from sin. So two contrasting opposite states. You were slaves of sin. Verse 18. You have been set free from sin. What made the difference? Verse 17. You obeyed from the heart the form of teaching that was given to you. So think about that. Paul is saying, you were, you were slaves of sin. But then you heard this truth, this teaching, this form of doctrine, the King James says. And then what happened? You became free from sin. That word form of doctrine, the word form is a very interesting word. In the Greek, it means a, a, a mold. So, uh, you know, when, when we want to make different things, whether in plastic or metal, just say a metal, and you want to shape a metal in a certain way, what you do is you make a mold, then you pour the molten metal or you pour the plastic into the mold, and then you, you let it solidify there, and then you get the shape. You get the metal that takes the shape of the mold. You know, it comes out in that particular shape. So what Paul is, he's using that word, the form, the mold of doctrine. That means the teaching we receive is like the mold. It shapes us. And in this particular case, he's saying, you were slaves of sin. Now you are free from sin. What happened? 
you receive this form of teaching, this truth. So this truth that Paul is sharing, it's like a mold that takes a person who was once a slave to sin and makes them free from sin. So it says this teaching, and you receive it from with your heart. He says, you, you obeyed from the heart this teaching, which was a mold which shaped you into people who are free from sin. So this truth in Romans chapter 6 is the truth that every believer needs to know so that we can live free from sin. To know that I was crucified with Christ, which means the power of sin is broken. I was buried with Jesus so that the power of the old life over me is gone. I was resurrected with Jesus. Now I've been given the God kind of life to live. I was raised with Jesus, which means I'm taken out of the influences of this world. The world cannot dominate. The influences of the world cannot dominate me because I've been raised up with Christ. And I'm seated with him. That means I'm put in a place of the highest authority and dominion. And as a believer, I reckon this to be so, accounted as a truth. And I refuse to let any of the old control me, even though it's around me, sin and the old life, everything's around me. I'm not going to let it control me. But instead, I give myself completely to God to be a weapon of God, a weapon of righteousness. And when I receive from my heart, I obey from my heart this teaching, I go from being a slave of sin to being free from sin and becoming, becoming a slave. Verse 18, he says, you become a slave of righteousness, meaning it's like, hey, I have no other way to live but righteousness. Are you all with me so far? Any questions? Any questions? We are purposely taking it slow. I just wanted to soak into our hearts and minds. Yeah, yes, Pastor. I just had a question. Uh, so is this what uh, Jesus meant when he said uh, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free? Is it this freedom from sin that uh, Jesus is mentioning? Uh, this is one one of you know the many the many things that the Word of God sets us free from, right? So when Jesus made those statements in John eight thirty one and thirty two, he was speaking of uh, the truth that if we continue in His Word, uh, we will know the truth, and the truth will set us free, right? Uh, 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 but it, it, what Jesus was giving us in Romans, in John 8, 31, 32, was like, okay, this is the key to freedom from anything and everything. You continue in my word, you will know the truth, and knowing the truth sets you free. Here, Romans 6 is, a, uh, is one of the specific applications where knowing this truth sets us free from sin and the old life and everything that Adam brought us under sets us free from that, right? But like this, you know, there could be other other, other scenarios where people may need to be set free from fear. Uh, people may need to be set free from uh, other kinds of challenges. And then the, the same truth, same key applies. That is, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, welcome. Any other questions so far? Shani, go ahead, please. Well, hi, I wanted to make sure when you said that we were seated um, with Christ, that means, did you say that we have authority? Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay. So in the spiritual realm, we have been placed at the highest possible level of authority. God could not have placed us any higher. He, he made us sit together with Christ. 
So we are seated on the same throne where Christ is sitting. That's the level of our dominion and authority. Now, when we minister, that is how we must minister. We must minister from our place of authority. We must minister with that sense of dominion and authority. Now, unfortunately, uh, I, I know our time is running out, but let me just say this, uh, you know, unfortunately, many of us feel like, you know, I'm just, I'm just speaking generally, that sometimes believers feel like we are striving for authority. That means I need to, you know, I, I need to uh, strive for authority. No, no, you're not striving for authority. You are in a place of authority and you have to op operate from that place of authority to exert that authority over situations or demon powers or things that are happening. Okay, so remember, you're not striving for authority. You are exerting authority. It's different. If you're striving for authority, that means you're, 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 you're still trying to get to a place of more authority. Maybe the authority you have is not enough. But that's not the case. The case, the truth is, you are in the place of highest authority that God could ever give you and me. Because he made us sit together with Christ. The, what we are doing is, we're exerting that authority over things here on earth. Spiritually speaking, over things here. So we're exerting that. And so you're bringing that to bear on situations. When you mention to people in your own personal life, situations, I'm speaking with authority on this situation. I'm expecting what I say based on the word of God to come to pass. And so I'm exerting that authority. So that's how we operate. Okay. Now, just to give a preview of where we're going to go with this. So Paul has explained this to us here. And, uh, and, and he, he, you know, he continues developing this a little bit further in, in chapter 7 and 8. So I want to just complete that in, in uh, next week. Uh, in chapter 7, he, he shows the struggle of a man who tries to live with, you know, tries to live a holy life or live victorious over sin and all of that in his own strength. He says, that's not possible. So then he says, he comes to chapter 8, which we will jump into uh, next week that says, look, the key to walking in this truth is the help of the Holy Spirit. So he's given us the truth, gives us some practical instructions, and then he says, depend on the Holy Spirit and you will walk in this truth. So we're gonna look at that in chapter eight next week. And then we will, you know, uh, wrap this lesson up on identification. Okay. All right. Thank you for listening. Let's uh, close in prayer. We've got about two more minutes and uh, we will uh, close. I think uh, somebody asked a question. Isaac, uh, who asked a question? Uh, oh, Collins. Does salvation have stages? If yes, what are day. Hmm. So Colin, can we, uh, can we answer it on Friday? Uh, I know we have a class on Friday on faith, but I will just take a few minutes to answer this question before we get, is that okay? Yeah. So I'll just answer it on Friday and then we will go forward, okay? Um, can somebody close in prayer? We will dismiss please. Who wants to close? Heavenly Father, I'm praying. Heavenly Father, we want to bless you. We want to thank you for this very moment of our lives. We thank you for the treasury of the word that you have shared with us this morning. And we thank you for the depth of knowledge that you have poured into our hearts. Lord, we pray as believers in your son Jesus Christ 
cause us to uh, have this knowledge with us every moment of our lives. That this truth will set us free from every captivity of the enemy, every captivity of sin, and every enslavement or the power of sin that seeks to dominate our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we pray that, Lord, you continue to lighten us on this word so that we can walk in the power of our identity. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a quick break, and uh, please get ready for your next class. I'll see you again, everyone, on Friday. God bless. Enjoy the rest.